Okay, so for this video, you're going to have to know what weird means. Not weird like that's strange or weird like that softball question I gave to Lulu on wording is harder. I mean weird as an acronym, an acronym standing for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, Democracy. Weird. And weird is weird, Western, educated, industrialized, rich democracy. Most people in the world don't live in countries like that. They don't live in societies like that. But we do, especially people who study psychology, especially people who study psychiatry. They come from very weird places, from very weird upbringings. So when we define weird as normal, our entire normal gets skewed. What is normal? Our normal is weird. Western, educated, industrialized, rich democracies. I actually just finished a book called The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. Can you see this? It looks a little... Jonathan Haidt, he's a very smart man. He's a moral psychologist, a moral psychologist. It's kind of like a social psychologist that studies primarily morals. What is right? What is wrong? How do we each decide what is right and what is wrong? This book is nonfiction, but I actually thought it was really funny because he starts off by describing an experiment he did when he was in graduate school. And basically what he did was go to all kinds of people, not just weird people at the university or by the university, but went to lower class people in the United States and also rich and lower class people in Brazil. And he asked them a series of moral questions. Some of those questions were pretty goofy. Some of those questions were like, okay, here's one and you know, I hope you're not eating. But, okay, for a family, their dog gets hit in front of their house. How tragic. Is it right or is it wrong for them to take the dog inside and eat it for dinner? They have plenty of food, they just decided they wanted to eat the dog because it's fresh. Is that right or wrong? And people would say instinctively what they thought about it and then they would use their morals to justify it. So hopefully, I don't want to assume anything, but when I heard that story, I immediately said, that is wrong. But then why is it wrong? No one's hurt. People eat meat anyway. Why is it wrong to eat the family dog? The answer is, it just is wrong. Why? I don't know. It just is wrong. It's gross. Here's another example he used. Okay, so a man buys a chicken in a store, a full chicken, a dead chicken, ready to roast. He takes it home and has sex with the chicken. Is what he did right or is it wrong? Once again, no harm done. But a lot of us at home said, okay, that's wrong. He shouldn't have done that. And so why did we say it's wrong if we can't rationally explain why it's wrong? It's wrong because instinctually we feel that it is wrong. The conclusion that hate came to is that we make our decisions, our moral distinctions, instinctually, like with our gut, and then we justify them with our brain. But the decision was made before we even talked to our brain about it. He calls us the elephant in the rider. Like our gut is the elephant, and the rider is this wee little man who sits on top the elephant. And the elephant basically goes where it wants to go. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know so much about riding elephants. I don't know if this is a good metaphor or a bad metaphor. People certainly do ride elephants. I can't imagine that they're only riding the elephants where the elephant wants to go. I mean, if that were the case, did all of those elephants who crossed the Alps for Hannibal want to cross the Alps? I don't think so. So we're not gonna get into the minutia of hate's metaphor. Basically, the conclusion he came to was that our morals are instinctual and not rational. Because prior to him, many had decided, many academics had decided that our morals came from a rational place. I was exposed to a lot of arguments like that, that our morals are rational, that we human beings are somehow rational. But when you really look at the evidence, when you really look at the data, you see, of course we're not rational. Have you been outside? How long have you been alive? People don't necessarily act in rational ways. They act emotionally. They act out of insecurities and then they justify them with rationality. This is why you have to be kind of suspicious of too much rationality, of too much analyzing. Because I know 
you shouldn't eat the family dog. And we basically all know you shouldn't eat the family dog. But why? What's really interesting is that he found that the upper classes, the upper classes in both Brazil and in Philadelphia were more likely to say, it's okay to eat the family dog because they were much more rational. And the lower classes in both places were like, nah, you can't eat the family dog. Nah, you can't have sex with the chicken. And then they couldn't explain themselves. Now they're less educated, so they probably have less access to words and ideas. But nevertheless, Haight said that they looked at him like, why do I have to tell you why you can't have sex with a chicken? Like, why do I even have to say that to you? And that is the correct response to that question. A lot of people out here will try to gaslight you, try to say, well, you can't explain it, so it's not true. No, 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 no. As Haight points out, we've been evolving for millions of years before we even had language. So that instinctual knowledge is still knowledge. It's just not put in a form of language, of rationality, of reasoning. Language is relatively new, the past couple hundred thousand years. Our line, our lineage goes back, you know, from these little mammalian creatures. Language just came when we were already human or already homo something, erectus something. I actually have to look that up. I think homo erectus had language. I'm going to look that up real quick confirmed homo erectus did have language but even still that is relatively recent in our evolutionary history so trust your gut i always say this to people trust your gut your gut knows more than you do and that is also the conclusion that hate came to your gut knows quite a lot more than you think it does now this question about why the upper classes were less likely to be not moral what do you say they were more likely to be rationally moral rather than instinctually moral. I had the question, is this the chicken or the egg? Are they in the upper class because they have less of a broad moral spectrum? They're willing to do more and that helps them, you know, social climb? Or are they, do they have such a limited moral spectrum because they are in that class and therefore because they are in that class it has influenced how they were raised i'm not really sure i would love to ask hate that question if he knows it now all i said about instinct is not to say that our instincts can't be flawed because in addition to evolution and how we came up over these millions of years what also forms our instincts is how we were raised and what our parents taught us in the early part of our life so it makes a lot of sense to be able to rationally change your instinct and explain to yourself why such and such is right and such and such is wrong i feel a lot of america actually did this within the past 20 years over gay marriage like 20 years ago, even our democratic politicians weren't in support of gay marriage. But by now, we now are exposed to more gay people, we are exposed to more of that lifestyle, and we basically understand that there's nothing wrong with gay marriage, it's just a regular marriage. And so we see our minds influencing our gut decisions in a good way. Now, flip side. Flip side to that is sometimes we can convince ourselves of anything because you can make anything logical. You can reason just about anything. As a former member of the debate team, I can tell you right now, you can argue any side. Debate team for the win. Anyone else in the debate team? I love the debate team. You had to take both sides of the argument. Even if you didn't want to take the other side, sometimes you were randomly assigned the other side. So you had to be able to make the case for both sides. So you can rationalize anything, anything at all, and people have. In the past, people have rationalized the most atrocious behavior. So this reason is once again a double-edged sword. For the longest time in hate's field of moral psychology, social psychology, people believed that we made up our minds on morals through our brain. Simply is not the case. And that's a good thing that's not the case because a right speaking snake oil salesman can make the case for just about anything. You have to be really wary of that. Also, historically, we have seen what happens when we fall into this cult of reason, this cult of reason worship. The biggest example of this, the French Revolution. They literally built statues to the goddess of reason, and they beheaded so many people, including many members of the clergy. I'm not saying France wasn't a mess, and I'm not saying that some of this stuff, maybe 200 years later, turned into a good thing for a lot of us. But at the time, at the time, So what are you gonna do? 
do. Sometimes you got to break a few eggs. Let me know down in the comments if the French Revolution was worth it, in your opinion. The French Revolution being basically the overthrowing of the French aristocracy by the peasant class, and they kind of took it too far, and then Napoleon came in and imposed order, and then he sort of took over Europe. It didn't end very well for Napoleon, but you know, live and let live. I'm actually going to live. <laughs> live and let live um a lot of people were not let live they were not allowed to live so maybe not live and let live i'm going to link at the bottom an incredible four hour historical french drama about the french revolution if you are unfamiliar you may notice that sam neill has fantastic french that jane seymour in addition to being absolutely drop dead gorgeous also has beautiful french we stand both of them because we stand beautiful french regardless Take a look at that if you have four hours to kill and want to see just an incredible, epic tragedy. If you're on this station, maybe you do. Anyway, the point of all that is you cannot worship reason. And it's a good thing that reason doesn't make our decisions for us because there are a lot of things that you can rationalize that are still pretty wicked. However, it is also good that we can rationalize away the wrong things that we were taught in childhood, whether that be racism, sexism, self-doubt, self-loathing, whatever our parents imposed upon us, our parents and our grandparents and our teachers and all of these people who were flawed in their own ways, everything that they imposed on us, we can reason that away and say, oh, they were wrong. That was a really interesting point by hate that I definitely enjoyed. Okay, so now we say, well, what does that have to do with anything? We're kind of in a certain precarious place in our country. There's a lot going on. I can't worry about the moral psychology of these people in India or these people in Brazil. And what about an elephant? I'm sorry, I'm not really worried about elephants right now. Okay, so hate brings it back. He brings it back and applies it to what's going on in our country right now. And as we know, we're kind of at each other's throats. And we've been at each other's throats for a while. So I don't want to make it seem like this just started, but it has sort of been ratcheted up with the internet. So now red team and blue team are just absolutely going at each other mercilessly. So we got two tribes. We have sectarianism basically starting to show its ugly head. We have red team, we have blue team, we have a house divided. We have two warring boxes, if you remember that video. So we're kind of in a really bad place. We're actually supposed to like each other. I know that seems very odd to a lot of you, especially if you're younger and you're seeing the country the way it is right now, but generally we are supposed to like each other. And we did go to a civil war that time. But there was a time we liked each other. No, I don't know. Hate kind of breaks it down. And he says, and this is what his studies have shown him, he's actually done the experimentation. He actually has all the receipts. He says basically this, we have a moral matrix and there are six things which hold up this moral matrix. Okay, six aspects. There is care and harm, and that's basically like giving welfare to people who need welfare. That's providing a social safety net. Then we have liberty and oppression. And of course, it's America. We're all for liberty here, and we're all against oppression. All of us, red team and blue team, you just define it differently. But it's the same impulse. Now, there's fairness and there's cheating, and this is obvious. All of us like fairness. Nobody likes cheating. Just a difference of definition of what constitutes fairness and what constitutes cheating. Now we have loyalty and betrayal. And this is staying loyal to your tribe, staying loyal to your family, staying loyal to your spouse and your relationship and your friends. I suppose this comes out of reciprocity too, because it's like if they have shown you goodwill, then in return, you must also show them goodwill. So that's loyalty versus betrayal. If somebody shows you goodwill and then you betray them, well, they're not gonna want you around anymore. Next up, we have authority and subversion. This is how well you respect the social order, the social hierarchy. We're seeing that we do need some kind of authority so that people don't just run wild, but too much authority just ruins all the fun. No one wants to live in a land of too much authority, especially if you're not the one wielding the authority, if it's somebody else, I don't want to deal with somebody else's authority. This I feel kind of applies to all Americans because it's similar to the liberty oppression thing. Like when do our leaders stop working 
for the benefit of our liberty and start working against our liberty. The final one is sanctity versus degradation. And this is, do you hold anything sacred? Do we hold anything sacred? This could be religion. This could be, do we hold the body as sacred? This could mean, do we hold ideas or knowledge as sacred? But do we hold something as sacred, which is above the human sphere? And what Haight found, this is very interesting, he found that liberals basically rested their moral matrix on the first three, care harm, liberty oppression, and cheating fairness. Whereas conservatives have a broader moral matrix. They're more likely to go to church. They're more likely to support the government and support the police. That's for the authority versus subversion. We all know hippies are notorious for protesting and liberals are notorious for protesting, whereas conservatives are notorious for supporting. And this actually is very cohesive for conservatives and cohesive for the red team because they stick together and liberals just don't have that in their moral matrix. Now, hate makes the point is this is why a lot of people are on the red team, why they are conservative, even if they're not wealthy. They just believe in these things. They hold certain things sacred. So if you're getting hung up on the sanctity thing, if you're like, I know I'm a liberal, sanctity is stupid, sacred, what is that? You know, maybe you're an atheist or whatever. You say, I don't hold anything as sacred. But think about this. If you said, no, it's not okay to have sex with a chicken, as hate points out, maybe you hold the body, the human body itself as sacred, and therefore, no, no, can't mess with a chicken. You can eat a chicken. Some people hold the body as so sacred that they can't even eat the chicken. This I respect. Not me, I will eat a chicken. But that's as far as I will go with the chicken. Now, if you're like, well, that's super interesting, I wonder where I fall, because just because you're on the red team or just because you're on the blue team doesn't mean you hold those moral matrices. Matrices. You may have different morals than your team. Now, this is gonna scare a lot of you because a lot of you don't wanna find out you're a black conservative. I did watch that movie, Uncle Tom. That, that's an entirely different video. I have nothing against black conservatives, but they are kind of alienated from the community. I will give them that. There is a narrative that black conservatives are bad when they're not bad. They just have a different moral matrix. If you want to find out what your moral matrix is, you can go to yourmorals.org and take a quiz and it will tell you exactly where you line up in these six pillars. Let me know what your scores are. Let me know what happened. I mean, obviously, if you turned out to be a black conservative and you don't want to lose all your family and friends, you can just sign in with a fake name and let me know what happened. I don't have a problem with all conservatives, but it is a particular issue in the black community of people not being allowed to be conservative, like maybe you're handing in your race card, whatever that means. Like if you hand in your race card, you get straight hair all of a sudden. So to all the black conservatives out there, to all the conservatives of any color, you're welcome on this channel. Hate actually makes the point that a lot of our morals are genetic. Not all of our morals, of course, but a portion of our morals is genetic. We come into this world predisposed to like one thing or another. Okay, so humans are omnivores. That means we can eat a lot of things. We can eat vegetables and we can eat meat. But we have to figure out what we can eat. So we have to try different things. And you know, of course we have a tribe. So some people are more likely to try different things and some people are more likely to be repulsed. Now, the average of this, the average of this is that we will find new things to eat and we don't risk the whole tribe eating something that could poison them. So we actually do need both conservative people or risk averse people. That's a better way to put it if we're gonna talk about how our personalities are predisposed. Risk averse people versus risk taking people. So the risk taking people would be like, oh, can I eat that? No, and then die. Or can I eat that? Yes, and then survive long enough to reproduce. This is his argument. Now, we do need the conservative people. Obviously, we need the conservative people because think about this. A Spaniard, let's say it's 500 years ago, a Spaniard comes up to you with a blanket and says, hey, do you want this blanket? And you're like, oh my God, a blanket. They're so nice. These Spaniards are so nice. But your conservative friend smacks it away and says, you don't know what's on that blanket. Don't use that blanket. That's why we need the conservative friend. So... I see that hate has the receipts. I see that he's done his research, but I don't know how much of our morals come from genetics. It seems to really resemble our family. Maybe that's genetic. Maybe it's our upbringing. 
obviously experiences in our individual life can kind of skew what we think. I know the past year of living in Los Angeles has made me really question a lot of liberal assumptions. And I'm glad that it happened because I see everything that's happened as a learning experience for everybody involved. Everybody can learn of what's happened this past year. So silver lining, huh? I don't know, it's just a thought, but obviously our upbringing and what we see and what we can reason and learn from and use to improve our worldview is going to affect whether we're more team red or more team blue, in addition to our genetic predisposition. Now, to follow up to this video, I'm gonna be talking to Dr. Donald Brown. A lot of you remember Dr. Donald Brown from Daddy Issues. We already actually had this conversation. It went for a long, long time. It was a fantastic conversation. We get into morals, the nature of good and evil, normal versus weird behavior, weird as in strange, normal versus strange behavior, all of these things. It's a super long interview, so I'm gonna to have to chop it up. Of course, the full interview will be on my channel as well, so stay tuned for that. So all of this to remember that we are living in a weird society. So if you ever stop and think, okay, am I crazy or is it everybody else? It may just be everybody else. It's probably a little bit of you too. Subscribe.